Let's get into um, maybe some more tactical questions here. Um, uh, you know, you being a medic and such, you know, what what is in your IFAC? What do you think are the keys to a good medical kit? I think the key to a good medical kit has a lot to do with the skill set and abilities of the medical provider. It makes no sense for me to pack, you know, advanced surgical tools into the IFAC of a guy who's basic TCCC qualified. So for me, it comes down to your ability to replicate effective trauma management under stress. What can you do when, when it matters? Mm -hmm. right? So the TCCC committee is the foundation for where most of our medical literature comes from. Now, granted, I've, I've worked civilian side medical stuff and I've gone to civilian classes as well. All of it comes down to the TCCC committee, which is the board that decides what I can do as, a, as an 18 Delta uh, on the battlefield. So um, they have approved the, the uh, SWAT, I'm sorry, not the SWAT, it's the Soft T uh, tourniquet. So the Soft T, S O F T tourniquet is the only TCCC approved. Mm -hmm. tourniquet to use. Um, the other TCCC approved hemorrhage control agent is combat gauze. Combat gauze is an extremely effective agent to use in areas that you can't get a tourniquet or you just can't get out adequate pressure to stop a bleed. Um, other than that, I would say uh, ACE wrap is a great tool to have. I found that ACE wrap is phenomenal. Trauma causes inflammation in the body. Okay, and Inflammation changes the dynamics of the body. So you want to have something that can change as the body changes, and ACE wrap is one of those things that can do that. So I've always have at least two tourniquets because one is none, two is one. That's our that's our policy, especially in medicine. So at least uh, two tourniquets. Uh, I like to have at least two of the small compact combat gauze, and then I like to have ACE wraps. Usually a large one and a small one, and a large one I mean like four inches, and a small one being like three inches. Okay. And I keep those handy. Other than that, it comes down to the basics. You're talking about um, packing, okay? So Curlex is a great tool to have. Curlex is a is a gauze that's rolled into a ball. Um, Curlex combined with the ACE wrap, you've got yourself a very effective hemorrhage control agent, okay? Now I'm I'm an 18 Delta, so I have a little bit of more advanced training. I tend to carry a small surgical kit. So if I need to do litigate ligation on a vessel, which is basically blunt dissection or otherwise opening up a wound cavity to find the vessel that's bleeding and get direct pressure on it, that's something that I might have to do. Advanced airway management is another important thing. I think everybody should have a small scalpel. Um, the scalpels usually come in like a small foil container and they'll say the blade number. The blade number represents the type of blade that you're going to use. Most blades are that, that people typically see are the ones with the round, the half moon shape. That's a number 10 blade. A number 11 blade is also a really great tool to have in case that you need to do precise cutting. So like doing a crike, okay? Doing a crike is a, is a, is a life-saving intervention when someone's upper airway is obstructed, okay? That means that no air is gonna go into their body above this point. You're making a hole here to allow air to get into their, their airway. So um, a number 10 blade and a number 11 blade is great to have. You don't even need the handles because once you undo the foil, you can actually fold the foil back and you've got yourself handled. Okay. okay. Um, other than that, I would say um, some some forceps, a flashlight, uh, and several sharpies. Those are those are life saving because you need to monitor the trends in that patient's behavior. What was he What was he breathing five minutes ago? How is he breathing now? Is he getting better? And then, of course, we've got our needle decompression kit. So you want a 14 gauge uh, catheterized needle with about 3.25 inch length. Uh, that you can use to do a decompression for a tension pneumothorax, which is uh, a collapsed lung, essentially. All right, now what would you recommend for people um, uh, back here at home and civilian, you know, say they're going to the range, say they're, you know, it's everyday pack, you know, what would you recommend for that? Well, the nice thing about being on a civilian environment is that typically you've got emergency medical services that are available within usually, usually under 15 minutes. So you're looking at, you can get rid of that tension pneumothorax likelihood. Um, it, if you don't get effective hemorrhage control on an arterial bleed on a person, three minutes tops, they're going to die. So the tourniquet is still a great idea. The problem with the tourniquets is that you might run into some legal problems. Okay? Almost all medical equipment that you look at, specifically written on there, it says only to be administered or applied by a medical professional. Right. Okay? 
Now, granted, you have a safety net that I don't have. You have a safety net in which the Good Samaritan laws will protect you. If you are in, in good acting, in good faith, you are trying to help someone is in distress, you have some legal protection there. Okay, um, So tourniquet would be a great thing to have. Again, the A-strap, the curl X, uh, and I personally think having an NPA, which is a nasal pharyngeal airway, is a great tool to have. Um, I think that you should have one or two of those. Um, and typically, what you want to do is you want to have it run the length of your earlobe down to the corner of your nose. The diameter that you want is measured in French, in French terms. Uh, it's 28 French is what you want for your, your uh, NPA, nasal pharyngeal airway. Other than that, probably a space blanket. Uh, you'd be amazed at how quickly hypothermia can set in. And uh, knowing the weather, if it's anything like it is in Virginia where I live, it'll be you know, 42 degrees one minute and 102 degrees the next minute, and right. you can't predict it. So keeping your patient warm and cool sometimes will help prevent shock or slow it down because shock is, is probably what's going to cause the biggest amount of damage to that person's body. So that would be a, a slight difference, less surgical stuff, you know, right. more hemorrhage control, airway control, basic things for the civilian side. And that's what I have in my, in my car. In the back of my car, I've got basic airway management kit and a basic hemorrhage control kit because I've run into several car accidents out here that have required a little bit of intervention. Right, right, exactly. So you know, do you do training? Do you train civilians or do you only train law enforcement, military? I have trained civilians before. Um, I found that there's a big delineation for me in what combat medicine and combat weapon tactics and procedures uh, and how they apply to the civilian sector. Um, I got to say that the people that I have trained have, have, were phenomenal and they exceeded my expectations. Um, but I think there's more legality involved than maybe I might be aware of. And so I removed myself from teaching civilian courses. I exclusively participate in, uh, in, in government in government support contracts. Uh, so I, I tend to, to stay there. Okay. Now, that is that just for medical? Is that also for gun training, self-defense, etc.? No, I, I, majority of what I teach is weapons and tactics. I teach um, asset recovery or hostage rescue um, and uh, house clearing procedures, um, convoy operations, uh, advanced weapons on the range, pistol and, and rifle tactics. Okay. Uh, medicine is also part of what I teach, so I, I, I teach that also. Okay. So as far as everyday carry goes, um, I'm assuming that you carry pretty much every day you know what do you like as far as you know do you do you like to run a light on your gun on everyday carry what kind of holsters do you like to use you know i learned i learned very quickly in, in uh in the progression of my tactical skills that uh more isn't necessarily better and more means more things can go wrong more means you're more weight uh essentially when i first started to carry uh, I had a little bit of an ego on my head, so I had a Kimber, a full-size 45, and I thought it was the coolest, baddest little toy in the world. <laughs> uh, Kimbers can be a little bit finicky, i got to tell you. They don't like hollow points. they got a really sharp ramp on them. Um, they, they tend not to like anything but premium ammo, and um, they're heavy, they're bulky. you got eight rounds, so make them count. So I, I quickly progressed back to a weapon system that I was extremely familiar with that I could take apart and put back together with my eyes closed because I've been teaching with it for years, and that is the Glock. Uh, I think personally the Glock is one of the ugliest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I think that it is, it is visually extremely disappointing. Yeah, it's not sexy at all. Word. But you know what? <laughs> I've, I've fired maybe 50,000 rounds through a Glock without one single malfunction, without cleaning the damn thing. So I don't know what kind of gun they're making over there in Austria, but the Glock is a monster. <laughs> it is reliable. It is efficient. It was user-friendly. It doesn't have a ton of sharp edges. You pull the trigger, it goes boom. You yeah. know, there's no safeties to manipulate. There's nothing else to it. It is probably the simplest, most reliable piece of equipment that has ever come out in terms of tactical weapons, in my professional opinion. So I, I carry a Glock. Yeah, I carry, I carry a Glock 19 uh, every day, uh, pretty much for the same reason. Um, so, you know, what, what are you, what's some self-defense tips or maybe home defense tips you could give out? And they don't even have to be, you know, gun-related. It could also sure. be lighting, etc. Well, I think mindset is the biggest thing. I think uh, one of my teammates, Sean, would tell you right now that, that he's probably going like this right now if he's listening to this. Mindset is the biggest thing. I think that the, the most... Um, 
the common problem that people have is that they have this perception of it could never happen to me. So I suppose that there's somebody walking around somewhere going that it's going to happen to me, right? I mean, there's somebody, somebody, if you, everyone else is saying it's not going to happen to me, that means there's somebody out there walking saying it's going to happen to me. Right. And I don't believe that that's true. So in my opinion, a person's mindset creates that, that victim aura of them, okay? So for example, if you like to go, and I'm, I'm just going to throw random things out. If you live in a, in a very high-income environment, okay, let's say you live in a mansion somewhere next to some movie stars, well, you're thinking to yourself, nothing bad could possibly happen here, right? Whereas if I'm a criminal, I'm going, who am I going to rob from? Right. A bunch of poor fools? Or am I going to steal from the rich idiots that think nothing bad is going to happen there? Right. I'd rather go steal a Lamborghini than my buddy's Pinto just because it's closer. So I think that that perception of, hey, this is a nice neighborhood, never, nobody ever thought this could possibly happen here, I think that, that is the predisposition. It puts people in that mindset that allows them to become victims. I don't believe in coincidence. I'm Christian. So when I became a Christian, I decided nothing is coincidence. So when you see somebody doing something funny, when you get a funny feeling from somebody, when he's looking at you and he's got a hood and his hands are in his pocket and you're running on the trail by yourself, don't brush that aside to a coincidence. If right. you're out there by yourself running the trails and you're a female, um, especially in low light conditions with headphones on, you are primo target. Okay, If you're at home and you don't have a way, you don't have a plan of action for what to do if someone breaks into your home while you're there with your kids, you're setting yourself up for failure. You either plan to, you know, have a plan, otherwise you're, you're planning on failing, right. is essentially what it is. So I think mindset is, is greater. I don't, I don't care if you, you despise firearms and you don't like confrontation. That's great. But the people that are coming after you, they happen to like that stuff. They happen to like confrontation. They happen to like violence. And they happen to like the fact that you don't like violence. They're right. counting on it, as a matter of fact. They want you to not fight back. So I think mentality is the, the greatest obstacle for people to overcome. Because we're, we're in this current modern age where people think that somehow guns kill people. I, I, I could kill you with a fork if I wanted to. That, that We shouldn't outlaw forks. Right. But maybe we should outlaw people that think forks can be used as a weapon. Right. So... The mentality needs to be changed, and I think that the um, that people need to have an awakening. There's a fine balance, and I go back to the fact that I have kids. I want my kids to be aware that this world is a dangerous place, but I, w I don't want to scare them to the point where they don't want to be a part of it. Exactly. I don't want to make them paranoid. So mm -hmm. where do you find that balance where you advocate awareness, but you don't freak people out? Right. That's a very, very personal thing for people to find out. So I think... Um, being aware of your environment, being smart, and don't don't ever call something coincidence. There's yeah. no such thing. Yeah, especially if something looks kind of shady. Absolutely. <clears throat> so what are your favorite, what's your favorite kind of gear and your favorite, you said you like a Glock, um, so we've kind of covered your favorite uh, gun, but, you know, AK or AR, what would you grab? I got to tell you, um, the AR is just something that I've had forever, that I've been using forever, and everyone keeps issuing me more and more AKs. But every time I've been able to go down range and pick my own weapon, I've picked up an AK. Bottom line is you've got a, a superior projectile, okay? No matter how sexy and glamorous my assault rifle looks, when I shoot that AK round, the bullet's going to be moving faster and it's going to hit you harder than the bullet coming from my assault rifle, period. And the effect that that weapon system has on you has nothing to do with how sexy it looks. It has everything to do with the projectile hitting you. So if my end effect is to cause damage, then I want to have a weapon system that is going to do that. I think the AK has its place, and I think the AR has its place. Um, I find that the, the, the 5.56 five, round just isn't a man-stopper round. It's not, uh, it's not designed to take people down. It takes, it takes quite a bit of, of energy transfer, and by energy transfer, I mean number of rounds, to produce a wound cavity that will debilitate a person. Otherwise, you're looking at headshots. Um, the AK, nobody ever questions getting hit by an AK. You, you got hit by an AK. You're going to know. Right. And it's kind of, you know, the AR is more based around shot placement, and the AK is not. Right, right, absolutely. I, th I think the AR is great. I think it's got some uh, some improvements that can be made. Uh, I think the AK has some improvements that it can that can be made. I personally, 
Uh, I'm not a big fan of a weapon system that doesn't lock back when the rat last round is shot. So I think that's a huge, huge thing to, to be aware about when you're firing an AK is that the AR platforms are going to lock back. That bolt's going to lock to the rear. You're going to have a very distinct sound and a very unique feel that tells you, hey, you've run dry. You better transition or find cover right now. Right. The AK doesn't do that. You'll fire, 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 and then you'll get a click, and right. it's too late. So um, that combined with the fact that you've got a right side uh, charging handle on most AKs, that can make it a little bit awkward. So you don't have, if you don't have the, tra the training and the practice, you've either got to rotate your weapon downward and slingshot it with your, with your index finger or rotate it upward and grab it with your pinky to operate that weapon system. The other problem with the AK that I don't like, that, that there are some systems that will rep reproduce um, more sophisticated safeties, is that safety is a pain in the butt, man. That safety is just not designed for you know quick response. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go somewhere and you're expecting enemy encounters, you just have to go on fire. And you yeah. have to be cognizant of your trigger finger because getting your hand forward and away from the trigger, trigger housing group, getting all the way forward and, and forcing that thing down, unless it's been worn down, you're going to make a pretty loud sound and you're not going to be ready to get, get into the firefight. I've seen some modifications that allow you to operate it with your thumb. And those are pretty nice, but I think uh, I think the the balance is uh, it's a give and take. It's user preference, I think. Yeah, I know Krebs uh, Customs makes a new. Uh, they make a uh, modified uh, safety to make it a little easier. Um, I run the AK74 um, as my uh, rifle. You know, what are your thoughts on the 74 versus the 47? Do you have any experience there? I don't, I don't find there's a tremendous difference in their performance. Um, I find that the, the 74 is a little bit more user-friendly. I think it's just because it's a little bit newer, a little bit more thought has been put into it. Um, as with most things that have been improved upon, someone's used it, seen a need for something to be slightly different, and that's kind of what you got there. So um, I think it's a great weapon system. I think it's a good choice. Yeah. <clears throat> so as far as uh, Rhino Wars 2 goes, um, this will kind of be the last question here. You know what can the viewers expect? At least from what you know, I know it's very early on. You got a couple months till it's coming out, but uh, what can they, you know, at least maybe expect from you, uh, season two? Well, I can tell you this: uh, we are not, we're not leaving any strings on the second season. Uh, we've got some outstanding support from some very sophisticated defense companies and some very sophisticated manufacturers that are going to provide us with some incredible toys for lack of a better word um we're not going to fight fair is what i can tell you none of us are out there to fight fair we're outmanned we're outgunned uh in an environment that is very hostile and very dangerous so you can expect it to be pretty pretty damn entertaining um we're going to do our best to make it uh visually fun but you know what our job is to get our job done and come back with the, you know the same amount of holes that we went over there with so right. um, that's our goal but what I can tell you is that the technology that we're going to bring to the fight knowing what we're in for and knowing what we can and can't do uh, it'll be pretty outstanding it'll be really exciting yeah I'm exciting you know my whole family's excited about season two to see what you guys right. are going to do I figured you'd have some new toys <laughs> I, I, you know what I wish I knew um, what direction things were going if I had more clarity on on a time frame um, I, I mean that We've got new weapon systems that are just outstanding. We've got uh, better body armor. We've got new personnel transport. We've got uh, better imagery. We've got night vision capabilities that surpass anything that we've had in the past. So, I mean, our, our abilities and our technological advances are going to put us in a whole new ballpark. All right, yeah, that's exciting. All right, well, thank you for taking the time out today for the interview. And um, I'll go ahead and put all your links down below where people can uh, get a hold of you and uh, check you out and to the link of uh, Rhino Wars website. And uh, so have a nice day. Thanks for coming and talking. I'll throw in there also that we've just started a, a nonprofit organization. So uh, the information is on my Facebook, so it's Ozmetic uh, on Facebook. We're looking for people that have any type of technological skills that can put together a web page or do some grant writing or stuff like that. So um, if you have the time and you're interested, take a look. Uh, a good friend of mine, Chris Parker, who works at the New York City Zoo, He's really the forefront of that. Him and uh, Maria Baltas are making that work. We're hoping, you know, other than capturing people, that maybe this is another avenue that we can approach and, and make a difference. All right, great. Well, I'll put that, I'll go get that information and put it down below in the description as well. Awesome. All right, take care. Thanks a lot, man.